It's often been said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, and that's true. And by that statement, what we mean is no matter what Satan brings against believers by way of persecution or opposition, that the church goes on, that the church continues to grow, that the church flourishes. Jesus said that he would build his church and that what the gates of hell would not prevail against it, right? So the church is going to continue to grow, to continue to thrive, no matter what opposition Satan brings. And we've seen through the book of Acts the persecution that broke out with Stephen, the first martyr that died, and then the persecution that came as they were scattered. The early apostles were beaten and arrested and told not to preach in his name, and God actually released them earlier from prison is he going to do again tonight? They must have a special angel that's just kind of created by God to spring people out of prison or something. Because we get that story again tonight. It's one of the favorite stories of the Bible. But as we go through this chapter, and we're going to cover the whole chapter, there are four things that we can remember that will encourage us whenever we are facing opposition or persecution or challenges in our own walk with the Lord. The first is, and I want you to notice it in verses 1 to 4, we find that God is in control. We need to remember when we're facing hardships and trials and difficulties that God has not vacated the throne, that God is still sovereignly ruling and he's in control. Even though things may look like they're out of control, God is still in control. Verse 1 to 4, it says, now about that time, we'll come back to that, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed, verse 2, James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Now then were the days of unleavened bread. So Luke gives us the time of the year when this took place, which was Passover, which was the month of Nisan, from, from the 14th to the 21st. So there was their Passover, and that was followed by seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And when he apprehended him, that is Peter, he put him in prison, verse 4. And he delivered him to four quantarians of soldiers, which is 16 soldiers. And they were keeping him, intending that after Easter or Passover, to bring him forth unto the people. Now it says in verse 1 about that time. What time? It was the time when Paul and Barnabas had left Antioch and taken the offering to Judea for the poor saints in Jerusalem. Remember the Gentile church in Antioch had gathered together this offering and they gave it to the apostles Barnabas and Paul and they took it to Jerusalem, actually still called Saul at this time. They went to Jerusalem and they shared that with them. Well, This is during that period of time that Herod the king. Now, who is this Herod the king mentioned in verse 1? There are actually about five Herods mentioned in the New Testament or mentioned in that period of time. And uh, they start with, first of all, Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the Herod that lived during the time or was there during the time when Jesus was born. And he's the wicked king that slew all of the babies in Bethlehem. And then he was followed by Herod Archilus, and then there was Herod Antipas, and then there was Herod Agrippa the first, and Herod Agrippa the second. Now this Herod that is mentioned here in verse one is actually Herod Agrippa the first. He was the grandson of Herod the Great. Now the Herods, or the Herodian dynasty, were actually what's called Edomites. They were from the tribe of uh, Esau, and uh, they, they, they were ruthless and wicked, and they were cruel, and they tried their best to kind of cater the favor of the Jews, but it, it was just a type kind of uh, where, where they were trying to be Roman kings, but they were also trying to get along with the Jews, but they were just wicked, cruel, ruthless, wicked individuals. There was also the Herod Antipas that had John the Baptist beheaded and killed him. So this wicked Herod, the king, stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. Now we know from the text that he did that because he wanted to make the Jews happy. Why did he want to make the Jews happy? Because he wanted the Jews to like him. 
So he kind of picks something that he can do to gain the favor of the Jews. So he thinks, well, let me try this out. I'm going to have one of these uh, apostles arrested and put him to death. So in verse 2, here's the statement. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. This is the first of the apostles, Peter, James, and John, and Thomas, and Bartholomew, and Nathaniel, of, of the 12 apostles minus Judas that Jesus picked, this is the first one to actually die a martyr's death. We had other martyrs already, but it started with Stephen, but this is the first of the apostles. And he was part of that inner circle that we sometimes refer to as Peter, James, and John. And he was the brother of John. And James and John, the two of them, it's interesting, were known as the sons of thunder, right? Because they were going to call down fire from heaven and have the Samaritans consumed because they didn't want Jesus to come through their territory. So they were called the sons of thunder. Now, another little interesting footnote there is this murder by Herod of James, the brother of John, this first apostle, was actually a fulfillment of prophecy spoken by Jesus himself. You say, well, what are you talking about? The mother of James and John, she came to, or which we call her Mrs. Zebedee, her, they were the sons of Zebedee, she came to Jesus and she said, Lord, may my two boys, James and John, mother's love for her sons, may my two boys sit next to you in your kingdom, one on your right hand and one on your left. And these guys are probably kind of embarrassed thinking, Mom, you know, just kind of, what are you doing here, you know? And so she's trying to give a word for her boys, you know, Jesus, when we get into your kingdom, can my two sons sit on your throne with you, one on your right hand and one right there on your left? And then Jesus said, you, you don't know what you're asking. Jesus said, are you able to drink of the cup that I will drink of? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I will be baptized with? And here's what James and John said. They said, yes. I don't know that they realized what they were saying. Jesus was referring to his suffering. He was referring to the cross that he would have to die on. And he's saying, are you willing to suffer and die? You're willing to be baptized with the same baptism and drink the cup of suffering that I'm baptized with? And they most likely very glibly just said, oh, yeah, we're able. And so interesting, Jesus then said, you shall be baptized with a baptism that I am baptized with, and you shall drink of that cup that I drink of. So Jesus actually predicted that they would suffer and that they would die. But it's interesting that James is the first in order, in light of that prophecy, of the apostles that died, but his brother John was the very last one of the group to die. So as best we know from history, the first one to die of the 12 was, well, of course, Judas, who betrayed the Lord, but there was James, and then John, and James died a martyr's death, and John, his brother, who, by the way, is the Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John and wrote the book of Revelation and wrote the epistles of John. He died of an old age. We don't know exactly for sure how he died, but tradition says that he died of old age. Remember, though he was banished by the Roman Emperor Dalmatian, he was banished to Patmos when he, in about 90 AD when he received the Revelation, the book of Revelation of the Apocalypse. And uh, some feel that even in his old age that he continued to preach and that he was persecuted, but then he eventually died of an old age. Now, now Peter then is arrested. Notice verse 3. When he saw that it pleased the Jews. So Herod killed James and saw that the Jews were happy about that. That he proceeded further to take Peter also. And it was during the time of the unleavened bread. So Luke wants us to know the, the period of time. So Nisan, the 14th to the 21st, this period of Passover and unleavened bread. So he has Peter now. So he first takes James and then he takes Peter. And Peter was no doubt the lead apostle. And so when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and he delivered him to four quantarians of soldiers. So 
there would be 16 soldiers, and each quantarian would have like four soldiers, and they would then rotate them. There would be two chained to Peter and then two outside the prison doors watching him. Now, earlier, prison, uh, Peter had been sprung from prison. So no doubt Herod said, we're going to learn our lesson from this. I'm going to really kind of button down the hatch, and I'm going to have these soldiers on top of him and chained to him so that he won't get away. And he was intending that after Passover to bring him forth unto the people. Now, here's the, here's the thing. At this time, the church could be very discouraged, very bothered, and thinking, you know, what is going on? This is horrible. James has been beheaded, most likely, when it says that he killed him with a sword. It's most likely that he actually had his head taken off. And now Peter has been arrested. We can't lose Peter as well, and they were probably quite upset and quite bothered. Now, whenever you look at your life and things are going crazy and you don't understand what God's doing, you need to remember this. Remember God is in control, right? That God still sits on the throne. Every time in the book of Revelation, God is referred to as being in heaven, he's still on the throne. The throne is not vacated. So I don't, I don't know what you're going through tonight, what is happening in your life tonight, what tragedy or darkness or difficulty or hardship you might be facing, but we need to remind ourselves God knows. God is on the throne. God is in control. I can trust in him. The second thing we need to remember, the background for it, is verses 5 to 17, the largest section of this chapter, and that is secondly that God hears our prayers. There's a lot of lessons about prayer in this story, but God hears our prayers. So number one, God's in control, and number two, when we pray, God does actually hear our prayers, and God does answer our prayers. Follow with me beginning in verse 5. Now, Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer, and I love that, Peter was kept in prison. So James has been beheaded with a sword, Peter's been arrested. And could it be that, could be that he was arrested before Passover and kept there the whole week? Now, why didn't Herod kill Peter during Passover? Because the Jews were celebrating the feast and he didn't want to execute him. Probably a couple of reasons. It would disrupt their feast. And number two, they would be so preoccupied with Passover that they couldn't appreciate the fact that Peter's dead and he wanted to win their favor. So he wanted to have it maximum impact by waiting till Passover was over. But the contrast is that Peter was being prayed for, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Now, when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, so it was an evening time when Herod was going to have him taken out and executed that, e that evening or early in the morning, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord came upon him. Here's a, another one of the great angel stories in the book of Acts. And the light shone in the prison and smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he said unto him, cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him. And he knew not that it was true which was done by the angel because Peter thought he was seeing a vision. What an awesome thought. Now when he was past the first and second ward, verse 10, they came into the iron gate that leads into the city which opens to them of their own accord. And they went out and they passed through on the street and for with the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, verse 11, he said, I know of a surety that the Lord sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came into the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname is Mark, with many were gathered together and they were praying. And Peter knocked at the door of the gate, and the damsel came to hearken, and her name was Rhoda. It's interesting, Luke lets us know what her name was. By the way, that's a variation of the name Rose. It's another uh, aspect of the ro name Rose. 
And when she knew that Peter was Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness. She ran in and she told how Peter was before the gate. And they said in her, thou art mad. And she constantly affirmed that it was so. And then said they, it's his angel, or perhaps it was his spirit, they thought. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door, they saw him. They were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with his hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go show these things unto James, which is not the James that was just murdered. This is James, the Lord's brother, who was in charge of the church in Jerusalem, who actually wrote the book of James that we're studying together on Sunday morning. So let James and tell it to the brethren, and he departed and he went unto another place. Now there's a touch of humor, a lot of humor I see in this story. That's why we so love the story. Go back with me to verse 5. What made the difference here, an amazing point that Luke makes, is Peter was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Now you say, was not prayer offered for James? Why was James put to death and Peter was released? Didn't they pray for James? And maybe they didn't pray, but they didn't, or did they didn't pray in enough faith? Well, what's going on here? Well, let me say this to begin with. I believe they did pray, no doubt, for James as they prayed for Peter. But this is one of the difficult things that we deal with in life when we're facing hardship and trials and difficulties is that we don't understand the ways of God. God's ways are not our ways. God's ways are beyond our ways. God's ways are past our finding out. I've met so many people that get mad at God because they prayed and God didn't give them what they wanted. I prayed and God didn't heal my parents or God didn't heal my wife or God let my child die or why did God let me lose this job or why did I get cancer and I prayed that God would heal me and God didn't heal me and we don't understand, we don't know. That's why I go back to my first point that God is in control and that remind ourselves too that God does hear and God does answer prayers but he doesn't always answer them the way we want to or the way we expect him to. And part of walking by faith and learning to trust God is that God doesn't always answer the prayers the way we ask him to answer our prayers. God has reasons and purposes beyond our knowledge and understanding that we just learn to walk by faith and not by sight. We don't know, we don't understand, we don't have the answers. Now, some people say, well, maybe God had plans for Peter and it was, it was, it was just time for James to go and God wanted to use Peter and God had ministry for Peter to do. We don't know that. We can't theorize that or we can't, we can't read that into the narrative. Actually, after this in the book of Acts, Peter passes off the scene. There's not a lot of mention of Peter after this. So we don't know or understand why God takes some people early, why God lets other people live, why some people get sick and die, why some people are healed, why other people are not healed. We just have to learn to trust God. You say, well, I can't believe that you bring that up, Pastor Miller, and you don't give us any hope. Your hope is in God. Your hope is being realistic and realizing that God knows better than we do, right? That God is sovereign, God's in control, and that God knows what he is going to do. We, we, we don't like that. We want God to do what we want him to do, but the idea is God is God, and that's where faith comes in. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. It's learning to trust God even in the dark. Even we don't see what God is doing or what God's purpose or plans actually are. Now, this passage certainly points up the importance of prayer. Verse 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Now, some people wrestle with the subject of prayer because they think if God is sovereign and God will only do what he's going to do, then why pray? Good question. And the answer is, is that God has actually ordained that through our prayers that his purposes and plans 
are accomplished and fulfilled. Now, this, I admit, again, is another mystery. But God actually uses us, and I like to think of it as joint participation. Prayer does change things, but also prayer changes us. And then we need to learn that God wants to save people, but he wants to save them as we pray and we witness to them, we share with them. You know, we don't just say, okay, God's going to save whom he's going to save, and whoever God's going to save, it's God's will and God's work, and we just let God do it. No, God's said to go into all the world and preach the gospel, right? And we need to pray for the lost. So the God that has ordained the end, the salvation of sinners, has also ordained the means to the end that we actually pray, that we align ourselves with God's will, and then we learn to pray, that we become joint participants in the work that God wants to do. And there is a sense in which that God works when we pray, and that God sometimes moves us to pray in accordance to His will, and then He hears us, and He answers us, and God gets the glory for it. But they were praying. Notice some things about their prayer. Number one, they were praying to God. You say, well, isn't isn't all prayer to God? Answer, no. Sometimes people pray to impress people, especially in public prayer meetings. You know, when you're praying in a public prayer meeting, you got you to use King James English. Thou, God of the universe, we comest to, to thee, O Father. You know, and it's got to be King James. Like God you know, listens quicker if it's in King James English. We're worried about the phrases and the words we use, and we're, we're too people conscious. Jesus said, go into your closet and pray to your Father in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. One thing you need to do when you pray, whether it's in private or in public, and this was a public prayer meeting, they were praying corporately, is you need to pray to God. You need to say, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You're talking to your Father. You need to realize your words are directed to God, not to impress people. And then notice they prayed together. There was a corporate prayer meeting at the church. There's power in corporate prayer. It unifies and unites God's people. And I think that we should be joining together and praying as a church. And then thirdly, they prayed earnestly without ceasing, conveys the idea that that was earnest prayer. The passage indicates that it was like an all-night prayer meeting. They, They were earnest in praying and seeking the Lord. The Bible says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And they were also praying specifically. They were praying corporately. They were praying to God. They were praying earnestly, and they were praying specifically for him, the end of verse 5. For who? For Peter. They were asking very specifically for God to do something. I've been in a lot of public prayer meetings where people don't even ask for anything. They actually just tell God, God, you know I'm really tired right now, and you know I need money right now, Lord, and you know I want you just to you know, see what I'm going through. And sometimes they're just informing God. And sometimes I'm thinking, just ask him for something, you know? We just tell God everything he already knows, but we don't get specific. Lord, would you do this? Would you specifically do this? And you ask God specifically so that you can see God answers your prayer. So they were praying specifically and interceding for Peter. And it's interesting, in verse 6 it says, when Herod would have brought him forth the same night. It's interesting that the night that Herod was going to pull Peter out of the prison and have him executed was when God delivered him. Isn't it funny that God's timing is different than ours? I mean, they were probably been praying for days, and why didn't God save them days before? Sometimes God waits till the very last minute just to test us that we will continue to pray and trust in Him. But God's timing and God's will is so very important. And then the whole concept that Peter was sleeping between two soldiers... Would you be sleeping if you knew you were going to be executed the next day? If you were in prison or on death row, and in a matter of hours you were going to be put to death, would you say, I need to take a nap? Would you say, I got to retire early tonight. It's going to be a big day tomorrow, you know. Things are really going to come to a head here, you know. 
I don't think so. I've never understood this last meal kind of a concept. What do you want to eat before you die? It's like, who cares? But I think it's interesting when Peter wrote in his first epistle in chapter 5 of 1 Peter, verse 7, casting all your cares upon him because he, what? That Peter put it into practice in his own life. And Peter understood that. When he wrote those words, Peter knew what he was talking about. It's funny, I was thinking about Peter sleeping in the Bible today. So many times you find Peter sleeping in the Bible. He's sleeping in Gethsemane. He's sleeping in the boat on Galilee. Now he's sleeping in the prison. It's like, does this dude do anything else but sleep, you know? He just eats and sleeps and fishes. But it's just an indication that he was just totally trusting God. And he was in such a deep sleep that when the angel of the Lord showed up, the Lord angel had to slap him to wake him up. This would make a great movie. He's like, Peter! And you can imagine, you know, he's doing, you know, you see the Z's going out, and he's like snoring. And he just had to shake him and wake him up. He's in this deep sleep. And then the Bible says the chains fell off of his hands. What a picture of salvation that is. And the angel said to him, I love it, verse 8, gird thyself and bind on your sandals. And so he did. And he said unto him, get your coat on, cast your garment about thee and follow me. Now it's interesting that so often in the Bible you see the blending together of the miraculous and the human. God opens the prison. The, the chains just fall off his arms. The prison doors open of their own accord. An angel shows up and springs him out of jail. And yet, he had to put his own clothes on. You know, if I were doing this in cartoon fashion, his shoes would have went on his feet, and his coat would have jumped on him, and he just went flying out, you know? Kind of like the flying Dutchman or something, you know? But yet, the angel had to actually physically wake him up. The passage says that the prison cell filled with light, which is interesting. I, I, I don't know how Luke got that information. Uh, you know, somehow Luke got that information because Peter's asleep. How did he know the prison was full of light? He was sound asleep when he woke up. And the angel had to shake him and kind of knock him around. Come on, Peter, wake up. And then tell him, gird yourself. That is that strap around your waist, but gird your loins, put on your belt, put on your sandals, and grab your outer coat, your tunic, and put it on thee and follow me. Remember when Jesus fed the 5,000? He told his disciples to take the bread and the loaves and prayed, and he multiplied it, and they had to pass it out. It's interesting, too, when Lazarus was raised from the dead, Jesus brings him out of the grave miraculously by his power but he actually told them to roll away the stone. So you have the human mixed with the divine. You roll away the stone, I'll bring him out of the grave. You pass out the bread, I'll multiply it. Angel wakes him up, miraculously opens the prison, but you got to put your clothes on and get ready to leave this prison cell. What an awesome thought that is. And so they went out and they followed him. Peter was following the angel, and he knew not that it was true what was done by the angel, verse 9. He thought that he saw a vision, which is interesting again, because in chapter 10 of the book of Acts, we just read it a few weeks ago, Peter was on the housetop of the roof there in Joppa, and remember what happened? He had a vision, right? By the way, I forgot that one. What was Peter doing? Sleeping. I love Peter. Peter and I had the same gift. It's called the gift of sleep. He was sleeping up on the rooftop, and he had this vision. So now he's sleeping in prison, and he thinks it's a vision. Now, when you're in prison, these are the kind of visions you have. These are the kind of dreams you have. He's probably smiling, <laughs> you know, and it's like, these are the kind of dreams you have. The angel's springing me out of here. But when they went out, the prison doors open of their own, go out for the pass to the first and the second ward, it says that Peter knew not until he got out in verse 11, and he said, surely I know now that the Lord has sent his angel and delivered me out of the hand of Herod 
and from all the expectation of the Jews. So finally, he pinches himself. He wakes up. He was kind of groggy. Thought that it was a vision. No, it's a real experience. And he's actually delivered. What an amazing thing. Now, when they had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. Now, this is the home of Mary, who was the mother of Mark, who's also known as John Mark. This was a home the disciples spent a lot of time at. It's believed that it was a large home because they gathered there in a large group. Some feel that it was the upper room from the day of Pentecost, and uh, that it was there that the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2. But they're gathered there praying. Now this Mark, or this John Mark, is actually the writer of the Gospel of Mark, and he'll be mentioned again here in just a moment and the end of the chapter where he becomes a traveling companion of Paul. So they were gathered together praying, and Peter knocked at the door. Now they had an outer courtyard around the house with a gate. Peter's outside, he's at the gate, and he's knocking on the door, and Rhoda comes to the door. Now another thing that's interesting about the prayer meeting that was going on is when Peter knocking at the door, they were praying. Have you ever been in a prayer meeting when the phone rings or something happens and you all kind of kind of look up with one eye like who's going to answer the door, who's going to get to the phone, and you know, somebody's praying and they don't stop praying and there's a prayer meeting going on. So I want you to imagine they're all praying and they're praying, Lord, we just pray for Peter. God, we pray that you'll just release Peter. Lord, we, we don't want Peter to die. We need him, Lord. Please deliver Peter. Lord, we just... Pray right now for Peter's deliverance and hear a knock, 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 knock on the door. And they just keep praying and they hear another knock. And so maybe Mary kind of gave a motion to Rhoda, you know, would you go get the door while we're praying? We're, don't, it's going to disrupt our prayer meeting. So Rhoda goes out to the courtyard and she goes to the door and she actually says, who is it? And it's Peter. And she recognizes it's Peter's voice. So she's so excited that she forgets to let him in. And Peter's thinking, he's looking around like, man, I could get busted any minute, you know. Come on, Rhoda, open the door, let me in. And she gets so excited, she runs back into the prayer meeting, and she actually tells everyone that Peter's outside. What's their response? You're crazy. How can Peter be outside? We're praying for him. He's in prison right now. We're asking God to deliver him. Come on, get praying with us. I mean, if this isn't humor, I don't know what is. This is just hilarious. And she goes, no, no, he's really there. It's, it's Peter. And they go, well, it must be a spirit. He's probably already been executed and his spirit. You know, the Jews had an idea that when you died, your, your spirit kind of hovered around the grave for a few days before you finally whew, took off. So he thought, well, maybe a spirit came to say goodbye to us or something like that. You know, this is like a seance and, you know, we're in this meeting and maybe the spirit's knocking on the door or something like that. And she says, no, no, it's, it's really Peter. And so finally she convinces them. They go to the door and lo and behold, guess what? It's Peter. And the Bible says they were, verse 16, astonished. <laughs> That's so amazing to me. Now, this is what amazes me, that they were actually praying and didn't really believe that God was going to answer their prayers, but yet God did answer their prayer. This is what's so amazing, that, that even though they weren't praying with the faith that we would expect them to pray with, God graciously still answered their prayer. So you need to remember, God's on the throne. God answers prayer. Even if you might think, well, I don't know if I trust the Lord enough or I have enough faith and I don't know if I'm praying with enough faith. You know, God in his mercy and God in his grace will answer our prayer even when we sometimes have unbelief. It's kind of like that, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Amazing to think about the fact that they weren't really even praying with that much faith and God in his grace still answered their prayers. And so he told them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, go tell these things unto James. And James 
is the Lord's half-brother, the author of the book of James. Now, let me give you my third thing to remember when you're facing persecution, opposition, and difficulties is that as God deals with our enemies, that God will deal with those who are opposing us and coming against us. God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Verse 18 to verse 23. Now, as soon as it was day, so this all happened during the night, there was no small stir among the soldiers. So early that morning, Herod was going to get Peter and have him executed of what had become of Peter. The soldiers were freaking out. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not and examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death, he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. Now, under the Roman law, if someone escaped from a prison, the soldiers would actually be executed or put to death. So Herod, this cruel, wicked ruler, has these soldiers, maybe without even talking to them and getting the scoop on what happened. And you can imagine how baffled these guys would have been that this angel actually came and released them from prison. So Herod has these soldiers put to death, and it says that he left Judea and he went to Caesarea. Last week I gave you the picture, showed you the picture of Caesarea along the coast there. So he went kind of northwest from Jerusalem up to Caesarea, that Roman capital. And so Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon because they came with one accord to him. So they came to one accord, having made Blastus, the king's chamberlain, their friend. They desired peace because their country was nursed by the king's country. And so upon a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, set upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout as Herod was speaking and said, it's the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord, here's another angel in Acts, smote him because he gave not God the glory and he was eaten of worms and he gave up the ghost. Now, I believe that Luke puts this in the narrative here so that we can see how God takes care of our enemies. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So Herod stretched forth his hand, and he killed James, tried to kill Peter, but Peter's escaped. And the Bible actually said he took off somewhere. It doesn't tell us where he went, but he escaped. You know, the angel delivered him, but now it's time to use some common sense and to go hide somewhere for a while. But yet God is the one who deals with our enemies. He takes care of Herod, and he deals with Herod and wipes Herod out. Now Josephus, the ancient historian, it's not in the Scriptures, he says that this happened in that amphitheater I showed you the picture of last week. Now we don't know for sure, but it says that Herod was on his throne. I don't know how his throne got in the amphitheater, but it's a beautiful amphitheater that sits there in Caesarea. You can see the ocean. And these men of Tyre and Sidon, which is up the northern coast in the area of today, Lebanon, they wanted to make peace with Herod because they needed him. The country was subsidized by the Romans and they needed his help. So they kind of made friends to his chamberlain, Blastus, and they desired peace with him. And so there was a gathering together. It was a political gathering and Herod was going to give a speech. And Herod gave this oration, this speech, and to butter him up, to win his favor, the people started clapping for Herod. And they said, oh, it's the voice of a God and not of a man. Josephus said that Herod had this beautiful robe on with sequences and the sun was reflecting off of it. And it's this beautiful day there on the beach and the sunlight hitting him. And, and, the, and you can stand in that amphitheater, by the way, and when you speak, your voice just echoes in that amphitheater. And they said, it's the voice of a God and not of a man. They're cheering him, buttering him up. And the Bible actually says that Herod was smitten by an angel of the Lord, not because he had killed James, but it's interesting because he failed to give God the glory. You know, there's a lesson to be learned here, right? Give God the glory. Don't take the glory that belongs to God and to God alone. Whenever God uses you, 
you need to make sure that you give God the glory and that you realize God's the one doing the work. This was, though, divine retribution. He was eaten of worms. This is a story that you can read to your kids before you tuck them in at night in bed. <laughs> now, little Johnny, be sure always to give God the glory because you don't want to be eaten by worms. They'll not sleep all night. But in closing, I have one last point, verse 24 and 25. Remember that God's Word and God's work will increase and go on. God's Word and God's work increased. Jesus said, I will build my church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So the Word of the Lord grew, verse 24, and multiplied. But Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. Now, while this was going on, by the way, Peter is in prison, James is beheaded or killed with the sword. All this is going on. Guess who was in Jerusalem? Saul and Barnabas. And then after this, they make their way back to Antioch. When it says in verse 25 that Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, they returned to Antioch, this Antioch of Syria, where this Gentile church is started, which becomes this missionary sending church. And when they had fulfilled their ministry, which was taking the offering to these suffering saints, these poor saints in Jerusalem, and they took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So they left Jerusalem and they took John Mark with them. John, whose mother Mary owned the house where the prayer meeting was going on at the time that Peter was released from prison. Now, this would have given Saul and Barnabas a new confidence and a new boldness to go out and preach the gospel, that God will take care of our enemies, that God is on the throne, that God answers prayer, that God will protect us, and that God's Word will go on. Sometimes we get discouraged and we think the church is going to die and the world is going to win. And we need to remember that God's on the throne, God answers prayer, God sees, God knows, God will take care of our enemies. Vengeance belongs to God. And that one day, God's Word's going to continue to grow and increase. He's adding to the church the Word of the Lord multiplied and increased. Verse 25 is a transition verse into chapter 13 where we begin the first missionary journey of Paul. They take off with John, Mark, Barnabas, and Saul take off on their first missionary journey and they take off with John Mark, who eventually comes back from the missionary journey. Now, this story of Peter's release from prison, I, I believe, gives us a reminder of how God saves the sinner. God gives us a reminder in the story of how sinners are delivered. We are all dead in our trespasses and sins and bound in the prison of our own sin. And God comes to us in His mercy and God comes to us in His grace. And His light shines and He opens our heart, opens our eyes, and we trust Him as Savior and He brings us salvation. And then he, the chains drop off and He sets us free and the prison doors open. It's a picture of conversion when we're saved, how the prison doors are open and we're set free from our sin. And I'm sure that Charles Wesley, the great hymn writer, had this in mind when he wrote this song, Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray, I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed Thee. I'm sure that Charles Wesley had this story in mind when he was writing that beautiful hymn of how God came in his mercy and God came in his grace and God revealed himself to me and he set me free. He freed me from my chains. He opened the prison doors and he sets the captives free. Amen. Let's pray.